Hopefully you can see from the screen here in just a second is going to be on the time period between 1945 and 1952. Uh, it's chapter 36 in your textbooks and uh, the title of the chapter is the Cold War Begins. Uh, just to get that uh, terminology taken care of on the outset, the Cold War refers to uh, the time period uh, from the end of World War II until the early 1990s when the United States and its Western allies were uh, more or less engaged in, uh, although not a hot war where you actually had armies fighting each other, but were engaged in a conflict with the Soviet Union and its satellite nations. Uh, so again, that lasted for about uh, 40 years and uh, certainly uh, captivated politics uh, in the world and, and most importantly in the United States during that time period. Uh, this chapter, chapter 36, uh, picks up at the end of World War II and the first section uh, that the chapter deals with are uh, the situation in regard to the economics at the end of World War II. And it just puts it in the backdrop of what the nation had been through prior to World War II, of course, had been the period of the Great Depression. And uh, Americans were not convinced at the end of the war uh, that, they were, uh, that they were out of those economic uh, problems. They thought that the nation might return uh, to a period of depression uh, such as had been faced during the 1930s. Uh, so uh, there was a concern about not having jobs. Uh, again, during some of this stuff has to do with what life was like during the Depression when the suicide rate was fairly high. There was a very low birth rate in the United States. Um, the war did end the Depression, but again, the concern is are those economic downturns going to return uh, once the war uh, is over? Is it going to be a return to the Great Depression? And initially in 1946 and 1947, as you can see uh, from this slide, from this line here, the gross national product, uh, which are the goods and services produced by a country in a given year, actually went down in 1946 and 1947. Uh, and strikes of workers going on strikes in different industries uh, uh, swept the nation uh, in the year or two following World War II. So there was concern that it might be a return uh, to the Depression. Uh, you had a backlash against uh, labor unions that occurred at the end of World War II. Uh, during the Depression and during World War II, labor unions uh, grew in their strength and their power and now that World War II is over and Republicans are more or less in charge uh, in Congress, there's a more conservative outlook toward labor unions. And a key piece of legislation, which certainly you need to highlight uh, to know, uh, is that the Taft-Hartley Act uh, was passed, even though a Democratic president, uh, Truman, who of course took over after Roosevelt's death, in 1945, Truman vetoed this anti-union legislation, uh, which outlawed a closed shop, that is uh, having an industry that required members to be a part of a union. Uh, that was outlawed. You can no longer have industries that uh, union mem membership was mandatory. It also created a situation where labor unions uh, could actually be uh, sued. And there, we'll talk more about uh, this concern about communists and the Red Scare that happened after World War II uh, in just a bit, uh, but members of labor unions also had to take a non-communist oath according to the Taft-Hartley Act. There was an attempt by labor unions uh, at the end of World War II in the late 40s uh, to spread the influence of labor unions into the South, uh, which uh, there were a lot of textile mills in the South. Uh, the CIO, uh, the Congress of Industrial Organization, that's a union of unskilled workers, which we talked about uh, in the Depression chapter several weeks ago. They sought to spread union activity uh, to Southern workers, particularly in textile mills and steel mills. However, that Operation Dixie proved to be ineffective. Uh, in the South, there was just, uh, in general, a concern about labor unions in general, uh, but race, as so often it does during this time period, uh, kind of controlled uh, most decisions in the South. 
uh, there was a, a problem with labor unions forming in the South uh, because the need of blacks to enter those unions would have been important, and Southern whites simply uh, were in a position where they could not tolerate uh, working with, uh, with black workers. So attempt to extend labor unions to the South, for the most part, uh, fails. A huge and significant piece of legislation that was passed right at the end of World War II uh, is usually known as the GI Bill. Uh, its uh, official name was the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, and you really can't overestimate the significance of that uh, particular piece of legislation. The concern was with all the veterans, some 8 million in total, uh, actually over 8 million returning uh, from the war, uh, how are they going to fit into the economy? And the government, through the GI Bill, uh, allowed uh, these veterans of World War II to come and to receive uh, free college education through what was known as the GI Bill. Uh, so 8 million veterans advanced their education. A majority attended technical and vocational schools, but as you can see, some 2 million or so attended what we just think of as traditional college and universities. Uh, $14.5 billion was spent uh, on that. Veterans were also given the opportunity to apply for and receive very uh, cheap and beneficial loans to purchase homes. Uh, so that uh, created a growth in the economy and was a tremendous help uh, to veterans returning uh, from, from World War II. So the GI Bill, a very significant piece of legislation. Uh, now moving into the second section that this chapter covers, what's referred to as this long economic boom from 1950 to 1970 uh, is what is dealt with. The big thing to keep in mind, the big picture is for this 20-year time period from 1950 to 1970, the United States experienced uh, a economic surge that was unprecedented uh, in U.S. history, if not even all of, uh, of world history. Uh, you can just look at some of the facts that I put on this slide here. Uh, the national income doubled in the 1950s, then it doubled again, uh, shooting through the trillion dollar mark in 1973 uh, in terms of, uh, again, that's gross national product. Americans, 6% of the world's population, but had 40% of the world's wealth. Uh, so tremendous uh, growth in economics. Uh, a lot of influence that led to a tremendous rise in the middle class, uh, very significant. Uh, you still had poorer people in the United States and obviously those that were very wealthy. But what becomes a dominant theme of U.S. history uh, from the 1950s onward is a very large, significant middle class. Uh, and the fact that there was uh, some sort of economic stability as the book uh, points out, it'll get into the civil rights movement later, but that lack of economic concern and the, uh, the situation where there's economic stability uh, paved the way for the civil rights movement uh, to progress in the late 50s and early 1960s. Uh, notice here more a lot of information. You obviously don't need to memorize all of this, but just to throw out the data and you can go back and actually review this actual PowerPoint without uh, my vocal, uh, if, if you want to look at it. But in regard to this economic boom, women uh, were the greatest uh, beneficiaries uh, of this. Um, they entered the workforce in large numbers. One fourth of American workforce uh, at the end of uh, this period uh, were women. And um, uh, you can just see the significant uh, influence and in numbers of women entering the workforce. Uh, but yet, and you see this kind of clash of, of, of kind of values, yet there was still uh, this traditional uh, view that women's role were still to be mothers and in uh, the workplace, uh, taking care of the home, et cetera. But yet they are entering the workforce uh, in large numbers. So you're going to begin to see the beginning of kind of the women's rights movement and concerned about women and the workforce as this clash between the demands of suburban uh, housewifery and the realities of employment uh, sparked this feminist revolt in the 1960s, which will be covered later. And then notice at the top of this slide, just as a, another indication of the significant improvement in our nation's income uh, during this time period, 60% of the people 
uh, now own their homes in 1960 compared to just 40% in 1920. So significant economic boom. Uh, what were the um, causes or what made that economic boom possible is what the third section of your textbook deals with. Uh, and the war itself uh, was uh, a large contributor to this economic growth. The United States uh, during the war, its factories uh, increased uh, and, and grew. So obviously that's a major uh, factor. And then when the war ends and it's connected with the beginning of the Cold War, there's going to be tremendous spending on the military uh, because you have to be prepared uh, to resist and fight against the spread of communism and the threat of the Soviet Union. So there's going to be a lot of growth in uh, terms of military industry, uh, what later Eisenhower referred to as the military industrial complex. Uh, the Korean War, which we'll deal with at the end of this chapter, it begins, and of course war uh, is often good for the economy because it uh, creates the need for goods to supply soldiers in an army that's fighting. Uh, so Pentagon dollars and dollars on military uh, and technology in the aerospace industry and plastics and electronics uh, uh, really grows during this time period. Um, cheap energy uh, led to this economic boom. Of course, that's somewhat different than we're faced with now. Uh, and notice the difference here. The United States and Europe, for the most part, controlled the flow of oil out of the Middle East at this time. After World War II, uh, the Allied powers more or less had control of that area. So this keeps uh, oil prices and gas prices low. Uh, so Americans were able to, um, uh, to consume oil uh, and buy cars, big gas guzzling cars, and did not have to worry about the cost of gasoline because we controlled that supply. So cheap energy uh, led to this economic boom. Um, and then what's also significant is another factor which led to the growth of our economy is that worker productivity increased. Uh, when you talk about worker productivity, a simple way to look at it is just the output that a worker can produce in a given hour of work. Uh, because of this high increase in our educational level, and you might even argue a positive work ethic, uh, United States workers were able to produce goods uh, and services at a much higher rate uh, than was the average across uh, the world. And you can see, again, emphasizing education at the bottom of this slide, by 1970, 90% of the school age population uh, was enrolled in educational institutions. So better educated and better equipped in the 1970s, that is our workers, they could produce as much as they had in the 1950s. Uh, so uh, the increase in worker productivity connected with improved education is a huge reason for this post-World War II industrial expansion. Um, Another factor that needs to be kept in mind in regard to changes that take place in the economy after World War II is the effect that industrialization and mechanized farming had on the agricultural industry. Uh, quite simply, uh, because of uh, mechanization, new fertilizers, government subsidies, all sorts of different things, uh, fewer farmers were needed to produce the same amount of farm goods that had been produced in past decades. Uh, just notice uh, that one farm worker could now feed 50 people compared to 15 people in the 1940s. So what that led to is uh, a decrease in the percentage of people that were working in the agricultural business. Uh, and agriculture does become a business. Uh, as opposed to uh, just these home family farms, which we might think of. So by the end of World War II, farmers made up 2% of, of working Americans, yet they fed most of the world. Uh, so uh, you have a decrease in the number of farmers. Um, I'm not going to really talk about uh, the, the pictures that come up in your textbook. You can look at some of those, but advertising becomes big in the United States during this time period. This is an advertising, simply arguing and convincing Americans that they needed two vehicles, not just one. 
uh, and Americans are certainly going to do that. The man of the house needs that to go to work and to take care of of his interests, but the lady with all of her children, looks like she has five children in this picture, uh, she needs uh, the family uh, kind of station wagon to do the grocery shopping and drop the kids off, etc. As you read through this ad, you'll notice uh, the traditional roles of men and women uh, that are laid out in that. Uh, the next section of this textbook deals with um, the growth of a section of our country called the Sun Belt. Uh, the Sun Belt refers to a section of the United States that stretched, stretched from Virginia uh, then south uh, across the southern portion of our nation over to California. Uh, during uh, the decades after World War II, this is the section of our country which saw tremendous growth. It had a doubling of its population, so the south and the southwest. Um, the population of this area just increased. Uh, federal funds in the states of the South and West uh, began to grow as well because that's where the population was. So you're going to see politically that there's going to begin to be a development of kind of a political and economic battle between this rising Sun Belt, uh, rising in its population, and the decreasing population in what was referred to as the Frost Belt, the Northern States, and sometimes the Rust Belt, uh, the uh, Great Lake states where industry used to be big, but the population during the post-World War II period, again, is shifting to the south and the west. You will notice, and I uh, just kind of hate to pick on our own state, uh, but we do need to, to be aware of it. Uh, as you see this map, I think you can see, if you look at the yellow, uh, that strip from Virginia, then sweeping on across the Atlantic seaboard, including Florida, uh, but notice the increase in the population of the so-called Sun Belt uh, skipped some of the deep south states, our state included. Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana did not receive a growth in population relative to the nation's growth. Uh, so the Sun Belt kind of skips over uh, the Mississippi and its two bordering states, uh, which is uh, kind of unfortunate, uh, but that's uh, just the nature of what you do see taking place during this time. Uh, another section, and then I think we'll, uh, we'll pause and let this be part one of chapter 36, uh, is a rise of an increasing rush to the suburbs. And I'm sure you're familiar with that term. Suburbs simply refer to areas outside of larger cities uh, where people move to uh, to get out of maybe higher tax rates and the hustle and bustle of city living. Uh, so the 50s, even though you had seen the growth of some suburbs prior to uh, the 50s, uh, it really explodes in the 1950s and 60s. Government policies really encourage this. The Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration allowed homes to, uh, to be purchased uh, at very, very low mortgage rates, so it made it affordable. Uh, for your middle class to do this. You could get tax, uh, tax deductions and interest payments on home mortgages could be easily financed with incentives. And government highways that are being built uh, make it much easier uh, for the breadwinner to work in a city, uh, but then to travel via new highways and interstates uh, out to the suburbs where he, where he lives. Uh, so the growth of the suburbs is significant. Uh, the, um, the, the focal point of the beginning of the suburbs in terms of what we think are these massive cookie cut suburbs with the same type of house, just one after the other, just string after string, uh, were what were called Levitt Towns, uh, which were built first on Long Island uh, by brothers. I think the Levitt brothers, I think it was two of them uh, who built these huge massive suburbs on Long Island. Uh, and that kind of became the prototype for suburbs that were built across the country. Notice at the bottom of this slide that this, uh, this growth of suburbs in the 50s of 60s is a white flight situation. Uh, because of government policy, uh, mortgage uh, type of, of rules and regulations on loans, uh, these things were only unfortunately made available to whites. So what you have is a situation where whites are leaving the inner city to the suburbs and leaving behind uh, uh, African-Americans uh, in the inner cities. Uh, 
uh, and and that's essentially just happened across the country in big cities as well as even uh, smaller cities. You can see even uh, similar type stuff if you take Hattiesburg, for example, uh, in more recent years with the growth of Oak Grove, Petal, etc. You can perhaps see some of these influences uh, continuing. Uh, so the suburbs uh, gave middle class folks the opportunity to get cheap homes, to get out of the hustle bustle of the South, uh, but you can again see the white flight section of it. That led to the creation of different service industries. Uh, we'll talk more about the growth of highways and stuff in the 1950s, but fast food restaurants, strip malls, uh, things of that nature are going to grow as a result of that. There's just a picture of the new highways and interstate system, which again will be a topic that we talk about more in the next chapter. Uh, some of the interstate system was built. Uh, some of it uh, concerned Cold War concerns to make sure that military weaponry could be shifted across the country uh, very easily, but also in case of some sort of, of war or nuclear bomb where uh, evacuation routes for people uh, could be made much easier. But uh, in regard to the growth of the suburbs, the growth of highways, et cetera, made it quite possible uh, for that. Uh, there's a picture of one of the homes in the so-called Levitt Town on Long Island. This was kind of a model or prototypical house, and you can see all the people going into it, uh, deciding if they want to purchase one of these many houses. They're going to look very similar to this one here. Uh, so just typical of what you'd see happening uh, during that uh, time period. Uh, actually, even though I said we'd let Section 5 be the end of this, I think Section 6 really flows uh, kind of with the first part of this chapter, so just uh, bear with it and let's deal with Section 6 as well, uh, what's referred to as the baby boom. Uh, we've made uh, even jokes in class about the, the boomer generation, uh, but bottom line, in the decade following, the decades following World War II from about 1945, depends on who you ask, uh, maybe until about uh, 1957, some would extend it on out into the early years of the 60s. Uh, you had a bunch of uh, marriages that took place in the post-war era, and you had just a, a tremendous growth in the number of children that were being born. Uh, so this major demographic explosion, adding 50 million people to our nation by the end of the 1950s. Uh, that crested in 1957, and then you did begin to see a slight drop-off in the birth rate at that point, uh, and it's uh, remained fairly flat actually after that. Our country's population has grown since the baby boom as a result of immigration, not because of birth rate. Uh, so by 1973, fertility rates had dropped uh, to the point necessary to main existing population. So again, immigration is what's led to the growth of our population since then. Uh, the baby boom uh, also created uh, kind of this ripple effect that went through our nation and is still going through our nation uh, even at this time. As we think about, uh, at the, as those baby boomers, of course, uh, grew up, it would have led to this amazing increase in the number of uh, elementary schools and then junior high schools and high schools that were needed to teach uh, this a 34 million uh, increase of, of those involved in younger education. Uh, so more teachers, et cetera. But as that bulge of the baby boom moved through the system, uh, it created both positives and negatives. Once uh, uh, you in the 1960s, uh, just finishing up this slide here, the 1960s, as those baby boomers became uh, teenagers, you had a shift to uh, the youth culture, the rise of of rock and roll and mass consumer products and things of that nature uh, where marketing shifts to the youth culture. Uh, and then uh, by the 70s, uh, the, the baby boomers are moving through the system and even now on into the decades that we're dealing with, baby boomers are reaching retirement age and the strain that it's placing on social security. Uh, so that influence or the importance of the baby boom continues to kind of ripple through our country even uh, to this point. So those are the first six sections of chapter 36. Uh, we'll deal with another chunk a bit later. Thanks.